Good afternoon. I'm Jana Martin, Chief Executive Officer of the American Insurance Trust, known to most of you simply as the Trust. We are delighted that you're able to join us virtually today for the next webinar in our virtual webinar series. Most of you are likely familiar with our risk management consultation service, the Advocate 800 program. It's one of our many benefits that our policyholders receive through the trust. Three of our advocates are with us today, Drs. Eric Harris, Jeffrey Youngren, and Lisa Bryant. Again, I hope everyone learns a lot over the next hour. Please join me in welcoming our esteemed presenters. Hey, thanks so much, Jana, and welcome to all of you. We're glad to be back. It feels like it's been a little bit longer than, than usual, so it's good to be back. Um, we're going to start as we normally do with uh, questions to a couple of pre-questions that have come in ahead of time, and then once we get through those, we'll dive right into the um, Q&A questions that are coming in. I do see you going ahead and writing them in, which is perfect, so if you have questions, you can go ahead and submit those. But we're going to start with a couple that um, that we have already. And the first one, Eric, I'm gonna uh, give to you. There's a little bit of a, of a case situation here. So a couple details I'll read to you and then the question. This is about a colleague who has discovered a very negative review on a website. Uh, the colleague believes that this review is completely untrue and also clearly defamatory and is very anxious about how to get it removed from the website, but is not sure how to do so. In addition, this colleague is in private practice, um, is, is currently closed to new referrals, is doing all of their work online. They believe, um, although it was signed with an internet tag, uh, they're pretty certain that they, they know who the client is. And in fact, it's a client that they've treated for a while and who has an access to diagnosis. They thought the work was going very, very well, but then the client got very angry ended abruptly and now apparently has written this negative review. So Eric, what would you recommend? Well, the first thing I'd recommend, and thank you, Liesl, is that uh, it's important to remember on all these kinds of questions that every case is slightly different. So we encourage you when you have a specific question to give us a call at the trust so you can actually have someone that you can go over your specific situation with. It's very, very disconcerting to get a bad review. Um, it's embarrassing and it's very difficult to shake off emotionally. And most importantly, at least in my um, projection onto it, it's often infuriating. Uh, when people call, there's almost always a concern that it will damage their business because potential clients may be deterred from seeking services or create doubt in those who encounter it. Bad reviews on a plethora of websites are a common occupational hazard for a psychologist. We get many calls from folks who have these things, this happened to them. The good news is that many therapists and consumers and other professionals have experienced it. And it appears that most consumers don't take it as seriously, at least as they once did when it was more of a kind of new phenomenon. Um, However, it's important that you Google yourself on a regular basis to make sure you know what's out there because you don't want to be in a situation where your client um, brings it up with you and you don't even know what they're talking about and you don't have a good response for it. The initial response of the, like this caller is, how do you get the site to take it down? Um, and if the content is really defamatory or uh, outrageously false, you may have some luck with the website, but the usual response of the website is, there are two sides essentially to every story. We aren't going to, we don't make choices between what our reviewers put out there and people who respond to them in an effective way. And you can of course respond to the review on the website. And let me say right now, don't do that. You can't really pressure the website to do what you want to do because the website has federal protection. Most websites are, are not um, able to be sued for the content of something that is posted there. Um, some clients ask if they can sue the client. And the fact of the matter is, yes, you could sue the client. Um, it, that, that would not be a violation of HIPAA. 
Um, however, it would be very expensive to get a lawyer to even consider it. Most likely the client doesn't have enough money so that if you are successful, even if you're successful in the suit, it's gonna be a pyrrhic victory to say the least. The other question is, should you respond? Um, the general consensus is that HIPAA prohibits you from responding because that would be an admission that you were in fact uh, a professional that treated this client. Um, some folks think that because there's an internet tag, that's not a real name, that if you responded, it wouldn't violate HIPAA. But our position, because we are somewhat conservative, is that that would be a risky strategy. Not only that, but the most important thing is that responding to a post gives it more legitimacy. There is nothing that's more attractive to people on the web than controversy. And if you respond, even if you respond in a very controlled and appropriate professional way, you don't know what the client will do next. Probably in many of these cases, this is an attempt of the client to stay in touch with you. It's better to be in touch with you in a negative way than not to be in touch with you at all. Um, and so uh, responding is really not a good idea. If you insist on responding, you can say that there's two sides to every story. Um, and while professional ethics and confidentiality laws prohibit me from responding to the substance of the review, if you want more information about the services I provide, you can go to my website at. That's it. Great, thanks, Eric. Um, Jeff, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I really think it's a it's a, it's a question that we get frequently, uh, and I think people need to know that most individuals who are now digital natives know that trolls exist. I didn't even know what that word was when I first heard it, but there are people who just troll around and put things on the internet. And I think for most uh, digital natives, that's pretty um, insignificant. And, and so most of the times these are, you know, hurt your ego, you're, you're angry and upset about it. But frankly, the complexity that could come from responding to it uh, is just not worth it. And, and I frequently say it's, it's really not a big deal it, 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 that people understand that they're individuals who do this and, they play it down. In fact, there are ads now about the trolls and the impacts of trolls on evaluation. So I think Eric's advice is absolutely right on. One more thing, Lisa, if I might. Please. Um, sometimes people say when, when they're on the call, they want to call the client and see if they can resolve it. That is an absolute no-no. Do um, you'll be seen as using your power inappropriately that would cause you much more risk than almost anything that you could have done in the treatment. So don't call the client. Don't think you can resolve it yourself. Um, that's true. That's advice that we give to people anytime there's a complaint about anything from a client is that you can't resolve it yourself. Once there's a complaint made, you really have to stay away. Mm -hmm. No, that's right. Thanks for mentioning that. Um... Okay, so uh, next question, Jeff, I'll, I'll send your way. Uh, in what way is informed consent a process versus an act that occurs just at the outset of the professional relationship? And um, does it become at some point an actual contract between the provider and the client? That's a great question. And, and actually one of our basic uh, principles uh, of risk management is informed consent. The other two are consultation or record keeping are the best defenses you have should someone question whether your conduct was consistent with or inconsistent with the standard of care. Informed consent is simply the rule book. It's a rule book that you establish with the client at the outset of treatment, the fundamental nature of your relationship. What, what you have to do in terms of duties, responsibilities, uh, whether information is confidential uh, and so forth. It, it in many ways is a contract. And that, that initial informed consent is something that's signed. But consistent with the work of uh, you know, Ken Pope and Melba Vasquez's multiple publications on this, they, they, they posit that it is a process and I agree because therapy changes. And so the road of informed consent changes. And so 
as therapy changes, so does the informed consent. Whether someone, for example, you in, begin individual therapy and then they say, I want, I want you to bring my spouse in for a session or two to help them uh, help resolve something or, or there's an issue that we need to deal with and you do that. Well, that mandates another informed consent because you've just complicated the therapy, you've introduced another individual. Is that individual a patient or not? You need to define that in informed consent. What are the, what's the, the individual's right to the record? Who, whose record is it? Are they a patient or a collateral? We have an, a collateral informed consent we actually have on the website for people to use when that occurs. But, but the point that's so very important here is that you've changed therapy and because you've changed therapy, you need to change the informed consent. And then that person leaves the therapy. Now, what do you do? I mean, that, so there's a, a shift again in that. Uh, and then someone starts to raise an issue that is wrapped around a legal duty that you have in, in your respective state to report or do something. Uh, you need to respond to, to that shift by explaining to them what might have to happen if they continue to go down this road so they understand the rules. So, you know, the informed consent uh, continues throughout the process if your relationship becomes adversarial and you have to explore termination. You need to engage in informed consent even at that point in terms of how are you going to end that relationship. Or if the patient fires you, uh, then you know what, what are your responsibilities and obligations to that individual. So you know, over and over in our consults, you know, we run into informed consent issues where individuals have failed to view informed consent as a process and, and when they talk to us about a, a question they have from, from a risk manager's perspective, we say, well, what does your informed consent say? And what have you told the client? And sometimes they haven't even read it. So it's like really a, a death wish to do that. So it's, it's such an important thing to do and such a changeable thing to do throughout the therapy process that you have to keep your eye on it as the therapy changes. Yeah, no, I, I agree, Jeff. Eric, anything you wanna add? I just would add that um, initially you wanna have a written contract that's signed. And the most important reason for that is the business aspects of it aren't enforceable without a signature. But the changes that Jeff was talking about, I think he would agree, don't require another written agreement in most cases. And the main reason that you wanna constantly be evaluating whether the client understands the rules that are going on is that you don't want the client to be surprised and feel betrayed by something that came up that they didn't anticipate and they didn't think would happen. So um, I, just those are the two things I'd add. Yeah, I think that that raises the, one of the other prongs of risk management, which is record keeping. So when the, the therapy shifts and you've explained an informed consent issue to them, you write it in the chart because the chart is a second witness to what occurred in the therapy setting. So I agree with that. You don't have you don't have to have another sheet of paper that's signed, but you do probably need to make a note of it. That you know, Margaret brought her husband Bill in. I explained to Bill that he was a collateral. The the notes of this session are going to be in Margaret's chart. There, they, he is not going to be seen as a patient in this relationship, or he is going to be. I mean, either way you do it, that you need to to. Uh, it, uh, make a note of that in the chart. Yeah, I agree. Although I will say, you know, we do have the collateral um, informed consent and it would be, in some ways it is helpful to get that signed. You may not have to, but also if you're going to make a big change, right? Like when everyone changed from in-person to uh, telepsychology, you know, getting an, a signed informed consent for telepsychology. So I think there are, I think general changes don't have to, but some of the big changes would benefit from having it. Oh, I agree. Do you agree? I agree. I agree with that. Yes, yeah. me too. Yeah. And the last thing I'll just pick up because I, I think you both sort of um, mentioned this, but you know, the, even that beginning signature, right, is not just here's the form, please sign it, but it's here's the form, take it home, look at it, come back, let's have a conversation about this and then sign it once there's some real understanding. And even that I think is a process that sometimes gets rushed or overlooked. And, and people get confused about 
the difference between a, a notice to consumers, which is what HIPAA requires you to give somebody by the end of the first session, and the informed consent contract, which you don't have to get signed at the end of the first session, you can send on with a client and wait till the next session and go over it then. Um, yeah, and I, that I think doesn't. That, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Well, I think that contract thing is really important because that's where you put the rules about if they're going to bring you into a legal proceeding or make you review things or if you you know what do you charge for that or do you even accept that you're trying to let them know what what your job is and then what are the uh, what's your relationship with the insurance company what do you do with copays uh, when do you expect them to pay their bill um, all all that should be in the informed consent. Uh, that and in, and if they have a question about it, they should be invited to ask that question. But um, it, it should be clear, and it, it it sometimes gets overly complex. And I understand that we have all the paper we need in this world now. But those issues, as a risk manager, I think Liesel and Eric would agree. You know, when that becomes a problem, all of a sudden you wish you'd done it. Uh, whereas if you just had done it on the front end, it doesn't become a problem. One more thing I'd like to add, which is that it's always a good idea when you start a session to go over orally the limits to confidentiality. So someone won't, before they actually get a piece of paper knowing what the limits are, they won't say something which like tell you about child abuse, which you would then have to report and they'll be completely, um, feel completely betrayed. So I always try to spend five, you know, the couple of minutes saying, um, it, it shouldn't take you very long. Thing. I just want to go over the limits to confidentiality because I'll be giving you a written form of this later. But I don't. I, I want you to know what you what I would be obliged to keep confidential and not. Yeah, just to beat this matter to death. I also think. One more point, that, Jeff. One more. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's really if if you're in a state where certain duties are not clear, like Texas or New Mexico doesn't have a tariff off but you want to reserve the right to do a terrace off, you can write in the contract that this is what I'm going to do if you uh, become a danger to yourself or to other individuals. So it, 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 it clarifies what your policy is. Uh, and you don't have to sit and wonder about, well, what does Texas say and what do I have to do? You've explained up front to the, to the client or patient that if you become suicidal, I'm going to do X, or this is why, the way I'm going to discharge my professional duties to you. And if they sign that agreement, it's a deal. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and we won't go into it now unless we have questions, but there's also you know, um, pieces of this that are really important for minors as well, right? Just in specifically exploring confidentiality with minors. You know, What are you gonna tell the parents? Not those right. kinds of things. So, I think we could probably spend a whole session on informed consent. Right. We haven't even we haven't even talked about what's going to happen with SIPAC. Right. You have to have an informed consent for every state that the um, client is actually in, as well as the rules on your own state. So that'll be an interesting uh, thing when they finally figure it out. Right. So I'm going to pause this there. If we get questions about that, we'll come back to that. But I do want to just take these last two quick questions and then we'll move to Q&A. But thank you both for, for all of those points. Sure. Uh, Eric, this will go to you. Short little vignette. Uh, this is a, a therapist who has a patient who requested a copy of their record. Uh, it's a, been a very long treatment and uh, there, it's a lengthy record of likely over 200 pages. There is a state law here that allows her to charge 50 cents per page for the records, um, but she's aware that HIPAA limits the charge to $6.50. In addition, she has concerns. Um, she's been working from home due to COVID, has her own health conditions, and is worried about going into the office to get the record and copy that. Um, the question then is, what can I charge and how long does she have before she has to send the records and or are there risks if she doesn't comply? Eric? Thanks, Liesl. Well, contrary to what you were all taught in graduate school, post HIPAA, clients have an almost absolute right to their treatment record. I'm not talking about psychotherapy notes, which we're not gonna go over in this because it's much more complicated and we'll have to leave that for a future time. But let me repeat, post HIPAA, clients have an absolute record right almost to their records. The only grounds for refusing the records are threats to life or physical safety. This is often a hard sell to many of our callers who 
have been taught over and over again that they shouldn't provide records to patients for a wide variety of reasons, most having to do with the possible clinical harm that would be done if a patient reviews their record. Of course, you're always welcome to tell the client that if you give them the record, they may, it may be very upsetting to them and you may want to suggest that they come and review it in your own presence. Um, it's important to remember why HIPAA was promulgated. HIPAA was promulgated for three reasons, to encourage client privacy, to encourage client access to important information about their medical care, and to facilitate the movement to electronic records so medical systems could communicate with each other and patients' health would not be damaged by the fact that other people weren't able to get records which would have been important to the treatment. Psychology really wasn't much of the motivating factor around HIPAA. Um, so before HIPAA, every state had a rule saying, this is what you could charge for medical records, which included psychologists were considered to be medical records. Um, and there was a wide variety of things that you could charge. Um, but unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, HIPAA overrode all of those state laws because HIPAA being a federal rule takes precedence over the state law. Um, for electronic records, there's three ways to calculate what reasonable costs are. Two of them require familiarity with ca calculus, which I don't have. And the third one is basically you're limited to $6.50 for electronic records. Um, pretty soon, there is now a 30-day uh, time period in which you're supposed to provide those records. But under new changes to HIPAA, as part of the open records movement, which we won't have to discuss now, it won't apply to most of you out there for a number of years into the future. Um, but when you if you if you qualify under the open records law, you'll have to provide the records almost instantaneously or in a very short period of time. Um, for paper records, however, there's different rules. Um, you are limited to the actual copying costs and the postage that you would entail. Um, uh, it, it, um, it, so 50 cents per page would probably be too much. If you go to, cost, if you go to um, Staples, um, it'll cost you 25% to use, 25 cents a page to use their machine. And that would be what I would safely say that you can charge. Many folks now with a 200 page record, I think it's important to be able to charge that kind of money. But if you have a 20 or 30 page record, given what's going on, it's probably wise just to give it to the client for free. Um, and HIPAA is very much it says that if your client can't afford whatever charge you would give them, that they you can't, you have to make the record available to them. Um, as to whether or not the, how the pandemic affects this responsibility, um, it's possible that it could be seen as mitigating in some ways if there was an issue. But often when clients request their record, they have a real need for them. Um, and because you are a pro licensed professional, regardless of what your risk status is, your professional responsibility includes the duty to get the client the record within that 30 day period. And not giving the record to your client is a frequent um, subject of HIPAA enforcement. And there have been some very large fines uh, established against people for not doing it. So. Well, I can empathize with your position, and I would suggest one of the things you might do since you have 30 days is, in most states, if you're a mental health provider, you can get vaccinated. Uh, you're one of the groups of highest priority. So if you haven't, I, I don't, this is a question, I don't know who asked it, but that would certain for all of you, if you're in one of the classes, uh, the, if, you, if your state allows you to get vaccinated, that would be a good thing. And you don't have to be COVID facing in most states. Great, that was great, Eric. Um, Jeff, any addition? No, no. I think it, Eric is is absolutely right on with with this. Uh, the The thing that psychologists continue to struggle with is an old rule that really doesn't apply in the era of HIPAA, which is, I know what's better for my client to get to read than what the client wants, and HIPAA may has made it pretty clear that if you write it down you need to know that the client likely will have access to it. You don't want to get into a fight about state law and 
in federal law. HIPAA really clearly says to everyone, it's your record, you have a right of access to it. Um, and, and, and I think that psychologists who adopt this position about thinking that they know better than the client about what they should read are just getting themselves lined up for some difficulty. Uh, and I, I uh, yeah, we run into that a lot with consults that people are thinking, well, I don't, I don't think my client should read this. Well, I'm sorry, it's their record. It's not your record, it's their record. Right, and I think that last point, Jeff, is, is really important because I know on a lot of calls, people are confused about that. They think they own the record and they get to determine, but in fact, it is the clients. We as the psychologists are just the custodian, right? Yeah, I mean, and exactly correct. You're the custodian of the record, which means that you keep it, you have to keep it consistent with the law and, and you need to know that law, how long you have to keep it. And the laws vary by states and that's a problem, but that's the way it is. But it's not your record, it's the client's record. And you know, don't write it down if you don't want somebody else to read it. And that actually sometimes does battle with the risk management advice that we give, which is that if something has occurred, you need to write it down because the record is a very strong defense in, a, in, a, in, in a, any kind of accusation or adjudication of, of a complaint. So record keeping is a bit of a balancing act, but, but yeah, Lisa, it is the client's record and HIPAA is not happy when you don't give the client the record when they want it. Another way of saying that, just to be clear, is you own the record, but the client owns the content. Because mm -hmm. you're not going to okay. give them your actual record. Right. That would oh, no. be no problem. But they are entitled to see the content of the record. That belongs to them. Yeah, no, that's a great way to put it. Um, and Jeff, I think your point about you know how we document, you know, we might have to document some sensitive information, but we should do so in a way understanding that it's very likely at some point the client's going to read it. Um, and so I think as we're documenting, we want to think about that. I am noticing the time. And so I'm actually going to go ahead and move us to the Q&A questions um, because our, our last question was on informed consent. I think we already kind of covered that. So I want to be sure we can get to as many of these questions as possible. Um, I'm also going to take a couple here out of order just because I think they're pretty quick responses. Uh, one, uh, and Eric, I'll send this to you first. Are you allowed to respond to positive online reviews? I don't think that, uh, I mean, well, I don't understand what the response would be. Thank you very much. Um, I, I you're think right. You, thank you very much. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah. You recognize my true capacity, true competence. No, I don't think it's a good idea. If you want to respond to somebody's positive review and you have a relationship with them, do it privately. Don't do it online. If the client comes back and then you say, I saw your review, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Or you could even contact them in a private conversation. But don't don't respond to anything online ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I think Jeff completely agrees too. We're all in agreement. I mean, because the confidentiality rule applies whether it's positive or negative information the same issue um, that we're doing. So the second one here, um, can you ask satisfied patients to leave positive reviews? You want me to do that or Jeff? Um, why don't you just jump in, Eric, I think. The answer is it is soliciting reviews is the same as soliciting testimonials. It's unethical um, and it, you shouldn't do it because you have th that, takes advantage of the power you have and the nature of the relationship you have. Um, you have a special relationship with clients that doesn't allow you to take it, what to, even though you may not think you're taking advantage of them because you're so good at what you do that all of your clients would likely wanna leave good testimonials. It is unethical. I think it's 5.05 .05 is the section of the code. Yeah, I actually think it, you know, people need to think about the downstream impact of these kinds of things. Let's say you did do that and the client posted it and then your relationship with them went south and they file a complaint with the licensing board that you told them that you wanted them. It just doesn't look good. It's really very ill-advised to do that. Uh, you don't know where you're going to end up. It, it, it's just, uh, it, it is an ethical issue, but it's a risk management issue. 
uh, and that then do you want the client to feel like you've exploited them or coerced them into doing into saying nice things about you and nobody wants to say bad things about their therapist right well that's that's speculation right so yeah, I entirely agree with Eric I'm sure you do too so. oh yeah I agree with both of you and I think um, two things, Jeff. One, to your point, I think people might say, oh, yeah, I'm happy to write it now. And they may not foresee that later they may feel very differently, right? Um, but also some of these reputation management companies, if you're if people are connect, uh, contacting them, um, they will actually recommend that you do that. They will <laughs> reach out to clients and get this. And that's very risky uh, for us as psychologists. So I think, I, I, yeah, I couldn't agree more that we should avoid that. Also, we've had people say, can I make up testimonials not that I'm, and yeah. that same answer that you know, that's not a good idea <laughs> right bad uh, idea yeah okay so another question then uh, i am now fully vaccinated my client who is not vaccinated is asking if we can hug at the end of our sessions what would you think jeff i think that's ill advised i'm sorry uh I mean, we could talk about hugging as, a, as, a, as what there are individuals who would uh, say that even doing that shouldn't occur in a therapy relationship. But beyond that, these are really dangerous times and we don't know what's happening with the virus. We, I mean, you may think that you're immune. Uh, we've got these new pathogens coming out. Uh, and, and so I think that this is a time of high level caution and not a time to throw caution to the wind. Uh, a couple of years from now, we then can sit and talk about whether you should be hugging your clients or they should be hugging you and engage in those kind of theoretical discussions that we had the luxury to talk about two years ago or a year ago, in fact. But at this point in time, with the virus, you know, 500,000 people dead, I think that's a bad plan. I agree. Eric, any additional thoughts? I think it's a very bad idea. If from a risk management point of view, hugging your client or in any way touching your client is very, very dangerous, no matter what the reason is, is for. It's particularly dangerous if you're, if it's a, Nick, it, it's a diff, it's a, a, the other person, if you're a man and the other person is a woman, um, we've just had many cases where that's led to complaints that have real legs. Um, so there's no need to touch your client, um, regardless of what your client may want and may try to do to persuade you to do that. Um, you know, it's just a good idea to channel Nancy Reagan. Yeah, I think that, you know, as a risk manager, it, 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 it always works out if it just works out, right? If there's no problem, but if it goes south, it's a real problem. And so you have to, before you engage in these kinds of things to think about, what the going south would be or could be of this situation. And, and so uh, we could talk about hugging and separately from this, but I think that especially with the COVID virus out there right now, um, it, it's, just, it's just unwise. There are too many unknown variables. Yeah, I agree. The risk, there's a risk always and it's heightened now. And if, as you say, Jeff, if something goes wrong, the onus is gonna be on the psychologist to explain his or her actions. It's not going to be, oh, the client said they were okay with it. That won't be sufficient. So, Okay, right. uh, another question. When we consult with a trust risk manager about a situation, is it considered discoverable if the case results in a lawsuit? Eric, you want to start? I've been doing this. We've had this program running since 1994. Uh, that's never happened. We don't think it would happen. We would try to say that it was legally privileged. It's never really been tested, but then We've done close to 100,000 consults now, and that's never that's never happened. So, um, right. it's it's. I would say that it's relatively uh, unlikely. Yeah, nothing, I think that nothing in the world a, the world is impossible. Yeah, it, yeah. I think it's also incredibly complex too. Whether someone would have jurisdictional authority over the records of a risk uh, of the risk management program, uh, you know, I think that the, the people who are are online right now. We, we have what, 500 people watching this need to know that we, we have, as Eric just said, 100,000 20 minute consults we've done. Eric started the program. I started helping the program in the end of the 90s and, and it's never happened. 
it, it, it's so it's a, like a, a theoretical exercise, right? There's a hundred thousand times we haven't happened. It's not something to worry about. Great, thank you guys. Now I will say one thing about that though. Very I often tell people to blame me for the advice I, you know, the, to use the advice I'm giving them as a reason to deny whatever quote request they don't want to meet. Right. Right, they can make us the bad guys if they need that in order to um, maintain rapport or something. Is that what you're getting at, Eric? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, next question. If you have gotten your COVID vaccine and are planning to return to in-person practice, can you require your patients to be vaccinated in order to be seen? Jeff, do you wanna start on that? I'm not sure you can require anybody to get vaccinated uh, with the state of affairs, but you can make a decision about yourself, about whom, you, whom you're gonna expose yourself to. So you can't require that they be vaccinated in the sense that you need to go get the vaccine, but you can say the only people I'm going to see in my practice are individuals who have been vaccinated and then wrap that around an informed consent that deals with the whole, um, you know, COVID crisis and, and so forth. You don't have to see people who are not vaccinated. They don't have to get vaccinated, that's their right, but you don't have to see them because that's your right. Eric, I don't know if you disagree with that. It's a well, I, I don't disagree with it. The point of it is though, if you've been vaccinated and the 21 days has passed, I think you can see anybody. I don't know why you would wanna require somebody to be vaccinated because they're the ones that are at risk, not you. If you have vaccinate, if you've been vaccinated, there isn't any risk that you will catch the virus from somebody that isn't vaccinated. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't disagree, but I think that there, there's at least. But I agree with your, I agree mm -hmm. with your response. You don't have to see anybody in person that you don't want to see or don't feel. No, comfortable. no, yeah, and and I, th I think that uh, you, we shouldn't be interpreting the health policies or or. The, the impact of vaccination on other individuals. I mean, every day I read in the New York Times different information about Pfizer and Moderna and Johnson and Johnson and so forth. But you can make, the, remember that you set your rules. If your rules are that you're not gonna see somebody who isn't vaccinated, that's your rule. You're entitled to do that. Right, just put it in your informed consent and assuming you're still willing to do telehealth for those people who aren't, you know, you can clarify that um, as well. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Um, okay, so this next question I'm going to ask, and, and I guess Eric, it'll go to you next, but just very, very quick, because I know we've talked some about this in, in multiple other webinars, uh, roundtables, um, but the question does come up over and over, and it says, given that clients may sometimes move locations very quickly because of COVID or be in a temporary out-of-state location, how should we approach this issue of being licensed in only one state in terms of informed consent? Well, the first thing I would say about that is that in a specific case, you should call and get advice on the specifics because it's very hard to make a generalized statement about this. But at least till the end of this year, um, when which is a, the federal emergency has been extended for this period of time. Again, you need it is appropriate for you to be able to see somebody that's been displaced by COVID, providing they have a plan to return. If they're leaving, if they've left permanently, that creates other issues which really need to be discussed. If there's a very good reason for you to continue providing services temporarily when they're in a different location, that's usually relatively safe. But again, this is one of those questions I think that requires a case-by-case -case, um, risk management consult. Yeah, I, I, I entirely agree with that. that but these are complex times. And uh, one of the things that you can do is you can go to the ASPPB website and they have a list by state of the temporary practice or the emergency orders that allow out of state practice. But I think Eric's point about if that client has moved away, you're not the best person to see them. I, you know, somebody there with them that knows the rules of the state, access to healthcare and so forth is the better person to see them. But, but they're gone away and they're going to come back. There, there are strong beneficence arguments that you, you should maintain the relationship with them. Beneficence is the most important principle in principalism in healthcare. 
So like, we're going to terminate them, make them go see somebody else, and then they come back and you're going to have them shift again. That makes no sense to me as a psychologist. I, I would just say one more thing about that, which is that if they are moving, but if they've been just, it's been sudden because of COVID, you certainly can keep working with them tele psychologically for a period of time so that you can terminate appropriately, let them get adjusted to where they are um, and find a new therapist. Yeah, I agree. Two quick things. One, Jeff, I, I completely agree with what you say in terms of the beneficence. I think it does depend a little bit on how long the person's gone before they come back. You know, so if they're going to be, if they're moving away for three years and not coming oh, back, sure. then that's different. But yeah, if they're yeah. going to be someplace for a month or two, then absolutely, I think that's a strong argument in terms of beneficence and continuity. Yeah, I mean, if you, let's say you're a university counselor, or psychologist at a university, and the students are now doing teleeducation and they, they and they're, they're going to return in four or five months to the next term. I think you just have strong arguments that the state's laying claim to practice are operating on the wrong side of the fence with this. Well, I do want to just uh, repeat what Eric said in the beginning, that really important. These are very complex issues. Our response here is so small compared to the level of complexity. So if you have individual cases, definitely call us, because sometimes things can, can sort of turn on one factor. Um, I also want to say that, yes, there are regulatory issues, but in addition, you really have to consider the clinical suitability question, which is a whole nother issue we're not going to get into now. Um, and last thing I want to point out, one of you I know mentioned the ASPPB site, which is a great resource, but I think it hasn't been updated in a little while. So just be sure that you're paying attention to what, what the dates are and even going to the state licensing board site. Um, because a lot of those COVID waivers, well, not a lot, but some of the COVID waivers have expired. Um, so you just want to be mindful of, the, of those issues as well. Okay, another question then. Um, with new folks, I assume here they mean new clients, who we began on telehealth, how should we think about the issue of when and how to meet in person? If folks want to continue te telehealth after at least one face-to-face -face meeting, what are the issues or concerns we should think about in terms of ethics and or risk? Um, and either anyone, either one of you want to jump in on that? You go first, Jeff. Well, I think that you, you, we do have the, the telehealth informed consent uh, that you, you can set up those, those relationships that way. And then if there is a movement towards getting together, you need to think about the way to risk manage your practice. Uh, it's not just you or the client but it's uh, office staff or other individuals uh, that they might be exposed to. Uh, I think that uh, Lisa, you're right on, these are really complex times. Well, you know, we don't know how the virus works. We don't really know, we know, it's good news and I think things are getting better and I do see, you know, light at the end of the tunnel, but this is not the time to become lax about um, uh, being conservative in the face of a pandemic. Uh, and so uh, I think you, yeah, if you're going to do it, what, what are the informed consent rules you're going to set forth? But then I want you to stand back and look at that and say, is that really a good idea? Uh, given all of the moving parts and moving targets, all the changes going on, is that a good idea? And if you arrive at the conclusion, yes, then I guess it, you've decided it's a good idea. It worries me. Let me just say that we have a lot of resources at trustinsurance.com about returning to practice in person. I would say that now, just from a purely risk management point of view, if you take reasonable precautions, um, it would be very difficult for someone to come after you saying that you gave them the virus. Um, people are out and about, the virus is spreading in very many ways it would be almost impossible for them to come and say that you were the reason that they got the virus. Um, there's also a number of reasons to think about seeing people in person. I had talked to a lot of child therapists who are very clear that telepsychology like teleeducation is not the most effective way to deal with children. And so they, they've asked how they can go back to in-person. And mostly it you know, you means you have to tell people that they have to take their temperatures or you have to take their temperatures. You have to wipe down the waiting room. You don't wanna have more than one person in the waiting room. All of this is available on our website. Right, 
And I also just want to point out, um, you know, that Medicare um, also has some some new information on requiring, you know, one, I think one in-person session at least every six months or maybe more frequently. But so there are some situations where you may be required if you're going to use, say, if, you know, your client has Medicare. Um, so you want to be aware of those kinds of things and, and managing it. But yeah. Okay, so we're going to take another question. This is one um, now specifically regarding New York licensed psychologists, but I, I think you can answer it sort of more broadly. Um, what are the limitations for providing a widely reachable online session uh, via Zoom or live on Instagram if there's no psychotherapy content? Um, so for example, it's a high level review of services available to certain patient populations and or if it is, has very light psychological content. So, you know, explaining what CBT is or discussing what psychotherapy I, process is like. I, that's impossible to answer. Um, I just would need to know a lot Any more. You want to I would just, uh, there would need a lot more information about what they're talking about. And the issue is, it's not what they describe it as, it's what the clients, the clients perceive it as. But that would be a good question to call and tell us more information about specifics of what you're trying to do and why. Um, it, it, it's, it, it, there are ways of doing this, um, but it depends on much more factual analysis to be able to tell you whether you can or you can't. Yeah, I think also the issue, it seems that psychologists frequently want to engage in psychologically related activities for which they're not responsible as psychologists. They, and, and, you know, it's like, well, this isn't practicing psychology. Well, folks, there, there are coverage issues if you're not practicing psychology. You're a licensed psychologist. You're providing a mental health related activity, why wouldn't you want it to be the psychological practice so that you stay consistent with both the law and someone can't debate it? But it seems like a lot of people want to go like, well, I want to do this, but I don't want to be responsible for it. And I mean, it just can't work that way. It's but a, there, and Eric but is there, correct, it's a complex question. The, the thing is, there, it, it is possible to do psychoeducation. That's really yeah. psychoeducation. But again, what is psycho? You know, the, what is psychoeducation? Sometimes seems to be equivalent to answering, asking how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. It requires more than um, what we're able to do here. Yeah, yeah. No, I think calling in is a good idea. Um, okay, this is back to the question of online reviews. What happens when the bad review is by a family member that you never saw for therapy? Eric, you want to just jump? Yeah, in? I think that the, my advice would be the same. Yeah. Technically, you could respond, but there are all sorts of reasons why that's not a good idea. Um, the, if you want to look at it, the, what you, you, if you respond to it, you have to figure out what the respo responding to it is going to do to the client. Is that going to be really upsetting to the client? Is it going to make the relationship with the person that, that did the review um, uh, more troubled? Um, it's just not a good idea to respond to reviews by whoever they are online for the reasons that we talked about earlier on. I agree. And it looks like Jeff, you do too, right? I do, I do as well. I really, I mean, yeah, you're getting into splitting hairs at that point. It was like, uh, you don't have a therapeutic duty or a relation, professional relationship with a family member, but they're part of that family. It's just not wise. I mean, I, what's what's the downstream problem that could happen and there i can write hard. a bunch of them i could write a bunch of consequences yeah. for that. it seems hard to imagine a positive downstream outcome of doing that <laughs> and, so. and the other thing i want to say is basically we don't have any good actual data it's mostly anecdotal but these reviews negative reviews don't seem to damage people's business in a way that we that's measurable right. and we're now in a period of time where um, psychologists are, you know, it's a boom time for psychologists. So worrying about these things as that they're going to damage your reputation in a way that's going to make it hard for you to practice, I, I just don't think makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question. Thank you both for that. Um, any recommendations for a thorough review of HIPAA requirements and laws for very small practices, especially in the age of COVID and virtual sessions? 
here that they just want to make sure they're, they understand the ethical and legal obligations. Jeff? Well, there's a wealth of information in health and human services uh, online uh, regarding HIPAA. There is actually a Security Act program that you can link into to, to kind of walk through and answer questions about your practice and how it is complying with or not complying with HIPAA. Um, we do our workshops all over the country and talk about HIPAA. It, it is a complex and evolving law. It's changing, you know, even this year, there are changes that are in it, but general overviews and understanding how it works and compliance with the Security Act are really readily available to people who are interested. Okay, Eric, anything you wanna add? No, that's pretty much, okay. I mean, we do have we, several of our workshops which are available, um, have parts of them. There's not one whole workshop on HIPAA, but there are substantial parts. And by taking one of the workshops, you not only um, get to learn about HIPAA, but you get um, a 15% discount for two years on your uh, insurance premium. So it's a double um, winner. Yeah, so here, thank you. Um, here's another question on HIPAA. If a client understands that email isn't HIPAA compliant and signs a consent to communicate and share forms via email, is that acceptable? Yes. I want to talk about that. Why would you do that? Why, why would you absorb that risk? I mean, it, it's your policy. I mean, I, I, they could even sign it away. Why? I mean, HIPAA requires that these. No, that HIPAA they, allows HIPAA allows clients to use email if if they want to. Yeah, it's but I'm talking about the client, the therapist, agreeing to do that and, and making it more complex. Okay, well, this so, is this is a way. I knew we would have to disagree about something. The two of well, us. Well, I think this is a great example of perhaps a distinction between what may be technically legal and allowable by a law and what is perhaps a, a potentially safer risk management approach, which is, yes, that might be legal, but I don't want to take that on. And of course, all of us as practitioners are going to make our own decisions about some of this, right? But it is important to understand, I think, the risks in both directions um, so that we can do that. The problem really now is during COVID, it, it's hard to think of ways that you can communicate, that your clients can communicate with you um, out of the session without using email. Um, they aren't going to have a, they aren't going to have an encrypted uh, email account. Um, what I think would say is that you can't send, I would think it would be a very bad idea for you to send anything that's PHI to them uh, with email. But if you want to send them blank forms that they can then send back to you by, and they choose, as long as you've made it very clear to them what the limits to confidentiality of them sending it by email, I think it would put too high a burden on people's, on clients about how to get forms back to you. I mean, what are you going to do with your informed consent? If they can't, how are they going to get it to you? Well, I think we are going to have to, it looks like Jan is back and we're going to have to be heading oh, towards the I want to just say, no, 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 that's fine. Um, I think there are a lot of technical options these days that email is not the only one and that it is a good idea to think about encryption or other venues to do that. So I know there's so much more to say on this topic. I think we, we could all three debate this in, in a really productive way, but hopefully that gives you enough. Thanks to both of you, Jeff and Eric and Jana. I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you.